What a message. I hope you'll take some time to contemplate the working of God in your life and how He indeed has been faithful to you. I would be remiss if I didn't point out an example of His faithfulness to you this morning. If you've got your bulletins, there's a little place in there every week where we kind of put statistics. One of them is our offering statistic. And uh, as we've worked through this fiscal year, which begins in July, God is continually faithful. But we've been running about 3% behind budget from the beginning of July. And uh, I want you to notice last week's offering report. That's not a typo. God, almost in one week, made up that budget deficit. He is faithful, folks. He knows it's His work, it's His church, you're His people, and He meets the needs. And uh, I would be remiss if we didn't publicly praise Him this morning for who He is and what He does. And you know what? He doesn't have to do that. Uh, We could run a budget deficit, and we would have to trim the budget and say, Lord, you must want us to do different things. Thank you for aligning our priorities. Help us to be good stewards. But you know, he's faithful all the time, folks. He really is. He's faithful all the time. And so we praise him this morning, and I thank you for your faithful giving. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. People do the craziest thing, don't they? Had one of those wonderful experiences this week. Gordon Road is half the size it should be. All God's people said, <clears throat> yes, put that on the internet. I want lots of people to hear that. Particularly when you've got people who are in the midst of a conference call That should be at the office, by the way. It should be at the office. And they know before they get there that they should have their coffee and they should have their makeup on. And instead, they have the conference call, the makeup, and the coffee all going on while driving. And then, they decide to turn left, apparently, without even looking. And so they put me in the grass on Gordon Road. Thankfully, there was nobody standing waiting for the bus. Because my one reaction was either she's having her conference call in my car or I'm going on the grass. And I decided for her to have her conference call in her car. So anyway, people do the craziest things. But I think most of the time, the emotion of fear causes us to do unusually erratic things. As you know, I had an illustrious childhood, and maybe it's just because my memories are so vivid. I remember a particular day, my brother, and I won't name which one, I have two, but he was running late for work. That was not an unusual occurrence. And so he dashes out of the house, and our driveway was very narrow and had steep banks on either side of it, but he he had it down to a science. He could back down that driveway without even really looking, and so... He ran outside, jumped in his car, thinking he was going to blur down the driveway out onto the road and off to work he would go. Well, what he didn't realize was was that he was late enough that my dad was going to work at the normal time. And my dad, two things he tends to do rather slowly, are leave the driveway and shop. He he, He just likes to look. But anyway, dad gets in his pickup truck and he drives to the end of the road, a nice casual drive, the end of our driveway, and he sits and he looks. Well, my brother, not expecting anybody to be there, he jumps in his car and by osmosis, he backs down the driveway, wham, right into my father's truck at the end of the driveway. Well, assuming all sorts of things, adrenaline running, he jumps out of his car And almost as just a reaction, he can't be mad at Dad because Dad had the right to be there. He doesn't want to be mad at himself, so what do you do? You're mad at the car. Like somehow the car did it, right? He walks to the back of the car and he proceeds to kick the car and he kicks the taillight and knocks the taillight out of the car. 
I'm here to report to you this morning that the only damage done to either vehicle was a damaged taillight. <laughs> People do the most erratic things when their emotions are heightened. What do we do when we find our emotions heightened? What do you do when trouble comes? What is a biblical response to persecution and trials? We're going to get to see it by way of example this morning. We may have not faced what these men will face, but we very well might. This is real trouble, folks. This is real. Per this is not a hypothetical. We've already seen that Peter and John have already spent the night in prison. So there's no question in their mind as to whether or not that's where they could go back to. I mean, this is real trouble. There are different kind of responders, aren't there? There are some of you sitting in front of me this morning that when trouble comes, you withdraw. Now, understand that most often my anticipation of trouble brings about the response that trouble will actually bring. And so I begin to anticipate trouble. I kind of think it's coming. It may not be coming, but I think it's coming. And you know what happens to me? I begin responding as though the trouble has already come. And so there's some of you that when trouble comes, you withdraw. It may be that your spouse does not have a clue of what is going on. And in your mind, you think they've got all the evidence they need, and they should know what's going on. And you're holding them responsible for knowing what's going on, but they, they don't know what's going on. By the way, you do realize that men and women's brains work differently, right? They, I mean, they really do. They, they really do. A woman's brain is like the, the circuitry of, of the electrical panel of New York City. Bzz, bzz there's connections all over the place that men don't necessarily have. I mean, there's just, there's just extra tendrils in there. And it's... And so, you know, she can say to him, hey, honey, would you mind cleaning up the kitchen? He cleaned up the kitchen. She walks in, she says, that. And what? And what, and what? Well, I didn't know that's what you meant. But I mean, she's all over it. Boom, 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 boom. It's, it's everywhere. It's amazing. It's, it's a God-given gift. Men have a mental chamber that women don't understand. The best way to describe it is nothing. <laughs> and they don't understand that because women never do nothing. A woman's idea of a day off wears a man out. Just so you know that. Baby, why don't we spend the day together? Oh, that'd be great. What do you want to do? Nothing. Oh, good! And a man's thinking nothing. And she's got a shopping list and rooms to be painted. And, but that's, that's nothing. Because it's not the normal stuff, right? So when she comes in to him and he's sitting in the room and she says to him, Hey, what are you thinking about? And he looks at her and he says, Nothing. Oh, tell me about it. Well, <laughs> well, there's nothing to tell you. If I tell you about it, I'm back to something and I really want to be nothing right now. Nothing's good for at least a little bit. Oh, come on now. I, yeah, I know you're... You just don't want to tell me, right? Tell you what? Tell me what you're thinking. Nothing. At least I was thinking about nothing until you started talking about something. And now I'm beginning to think I should be thinking of Is there something I should be thinking of? Wow. I don't know where that came from. I hope somebody got it down, though, because I think it was pretty good. Some people withdraw. In anticipation of trouble, don't we? There, there are some who become preemptive. It's now been called the Bush Doctrine. You think they might? Wipe them out before they do. And unfortunately, in relationships, there are some 
Fear comes, they anticipate, and I mean, we, we better unleash the arsenal. So that at least when they come at me, they're somewhat handicapped. And so it, it's, it's on. It's, it's get offensive. Attack, attack, attack. Somebody. Attack somebody. That's our response to fear, to trouble. And then there are some who are much more calculated. It's attack and then withdraw. And watch, just to see how they respond. Because, you know, like, you don't want to be careful, because if you wound them, sometimes a wounded animal is worse. And so, like, you want to attack and then with, withdraw. We all have responses, don't we? It's funny to look out over the congregation, because I see different people smiling. And you know what's so funny right now is, well, <laughs> wives are sitting here thinking, you just described my husband. And husbands are sitting here thinking, you just described my wife. And very few people are sitting here thinking, you just described me. So let's change for a minute. Who are you? Which one are you? And even more, even as we can see it relationally, let's think about who we are as believers. In a world that's filled with trouble, Do you realize that we are living in a casualty-creating world? We are living in a world that is filled with spiritual landmines. And it's only but by the grace of God that we don't walk in here every week to gather as a body and we don't have another list of people who are casualty. A limb blown off. Spiritual wound. We live in a casualty creating world. And more and more and more and more, the church is to be, in a sense, an ER. A place of rescue. A place of immediate, initial help. Boy, I wonder. I wonder when the wounds of the world come and people drive by 1401 North College Road, do they look in and think, you know what, I think I'd get help there. I think, I think somebody might care there. I think, I think, I think somebody will, will put their arm around me. Somebody will love me. How do I respond? And we're going to see them face real trouble today, and we're going to see their response. Follow along. I'm going to begin in verse 8 of chapter 4. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Let me stop. Don't miss this, because this is one of those phrases we kind of like, whew, right on by. What did Jesus say would happen if he went away. It's needful for you that I go away. Because if I go, I'll send another comforter. And when he is come, he will call to remembrance all things whatsoever I have taught you. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses. Don't miss this. Here they are on trial. It's on. It's showtime. This is it. Is God going to show up? Is what Jesus said was going to happen, going to happen? And John records for us, Amen and Amen. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he has made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. 
This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Let me stop first. Because the first thing I want you to see is the immediate response. The immediate response. Notice, first of all, he's humble and respectful, isn't he? You rulers and elders of Israel. He's humble and respectful. He's not ignorant, he's not rude, he's not crash. Now think, think of the circumstances, folks. He is standing in front of the men that killed the most dear person on earth to him. The person upon which all his hopes and all his dreams rested. He didn't just watch them kill him. He watched them glory in his torture. He watched them mock him spit on him, deride him. Now he's standing in front of them. How's your heart responding? <laughs> oh, yeah. I may never get this chance again, but now that I've got it, you're getting it. I mean, here it comes. I, I've rehearsed this in my mind. You're getting it. Humble, respectful. Why? Because you're going to see in a moment that he clearly understands who he represents. And he wants his testimony and his character to clearly reflect the one he's representing. That, that's tough. In fact, it only happens when we are controlled by the Holy Spirit. That word filled there is the word plerao, means to be filled to the full or filled up or controlled by. Peter, under the control of the Holy Spirit, spoke. You know what? I'm finding it more and more true that you cannot be controlled by emotions and the Spirit. doesn't mean that when the Holy Spirit's not working in my life that I can't be emotional. In fact, I'm finding more and more with me it's harder to divorce the two. But which one's in control of those two things? There's no doubt Peter was emotional here, but he was controlled by the Holy Spirit. Boy, before I engage in conversation, in conflict, if I would take the time to surrender my emotions to the Spirit. God, this does matter to me. This is important to me. This does matter to me. Thank you that it does. But I know that it matters more to you. God, this is not about self-justification here. I'm not out to get my pound of flesh. God, I want to represent you. And immediately, almost as I'm even going through that process, I feel the emotions come into check. Because I'm controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's not some easy thing here for them just to, to speak. And the inclination here is that this wasn't some well-manuscripted lecture that Peter's going to give. They're put on the spot. And the question they're asked is an enticing one, by the way, because the one thing that the Sanhedrin here could find as an offense in them and could use to throw them in jail and ultimately put them to death is if they had done this under the power of of demonic spirits. Thus the question, do you know what authority you did this in? Because if they don't have a clear answer, they're going to say you're demon-possessed. You're going to jail, and you're going to be put to death. That's where they're going. This is a leading question. Thus Peter's answer is incredibly clear. First of all, if it was demon-possession the result will not be a good thing. So he says, if you're wondering about this man that was healed over here, 
which is a good work, which could not be done by a demon? You need to know, and all the people of Israel need to know, that it's done under the authority of Jesus Christ. It was humble and respectful. But then secondly, his immediate response was completely filled with truth. It was completely filled with truth. There is no exaggeration in his answer. There's no hyperbole. Do you know that when emotion takes control, we run to hyperbole? You say, I've never done that because I don't even know what that is. It's not a type of bubblegum, hyperbole. It sounds like it. It means that I run to exaggerated extremes and I make them the definition of our experience. You say, I, I don't know that I've ever done that. Have you ever stood in front of your child and say, you always ever said that? You're guilty. Because it's not that they always, is it? How about this one? If I've told you once, I've told you, you finish it for me. You're guilty. Have they done it a thousand times? It sure seems like it. We can relate to it with our children, right? But you know what? We, we do it with other adults, don't we? And you know what it does? It puts us in an impossible situation because they're now going to answer the hyperbole and you're thinking about it, how often they do it. And they say, no, I don't. And you say, well, yeah, yeah, you do. You did it last week, the week before, the week before that. Yeah, yeah I know, but, but what you said is not true. Well, it is true. No, no, it's not true. And you know what? They're right. It's not true. Because we have run to emotional extremes. Notice, his answer is filled with truth. In our relationships, by the way, when conflict comes, if we would surrender our emotions, we control the Spirit, and speak truth in love, our conversation would be more productive, wouldn't it? I'm not going to use exaggeration to make my point. I'm going to speak truth. The reality of it is what I'm wanting to express right now is you hurt me. And in my heart, my heart is telling me that you did it, you did it intentionally, and you don't care. That's what I'm feeling. But to express that, I run to all kinds of exaggeration. In this conflict, he speaks the truth, direct truth. You know, when we face persecution for our faith, folks, we need to speak truth. Do you know the truth? They knew it. You need to know that the authority by which this good work was done is Jesus Christ. By the way, you need to know who He is. Psalm 118 talks about him and says that the builders are going to set the cornerstone at night, but he is going to be the corner and the house is going to be built by him. You are the builders and you crucified him. But God hath raised him from the dead. And it's in his authority and by his power that we do these things. And then notice the net that he draws in verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He says, it's the only name the only authority by which we can do anything. It's an indictment. There isn't salvation in your name. There isn't salvation in your system. There isn't salvation in your authority. And what you're after is to tell us that the only right we have to speak is if you give it to us, but we want you to understand, not going to happen. Because you don't have any authority. 
This is the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This is the only authority. By the way, did you hear what this verse said? You will not stand in front of God and claim the name of the Pope. You will not stand in front of God and claim the name Buddha, Muhammad, Krishna, some imam. I will not one day stand before God and claim the name Alan Benson and have any right to heaven. There's one name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. I must be saved through that name and that name alone. And that name is Jesus Christ. Friend, if you're here today and you have not placed your face in the cross work of Jesus Christ, the fact that He lived a sinless life and died a vicarious, substitutionary, atoning death to pay the penalty for your sin, said, God, I'm a sinner. He's the Savior. If I'm going to heaven, I'm going because He took my place. Please forgive me. My friend, hear me. If you have not come to that place, you will not come to God's heaven. And so notice their immediate response. Humble. Respectful. Truth-filled. That should be our immediate response when trouble comes. But then I want you to see, secondly, their proximate response. Sanhedrin response. They sense their boldness. And honestly, they don't know what to do with them. They're disappointed because there's not a crime. And they fear men. No crime, but a crowd. And they have always been about a crowd. And when the crowd is against them, the crowd seems to be for these men, and there's no clear crime, they have to let them go. And so they let them go, but they harass them. They say to him, Go, but don't speak in this name anymore. Don't talk about him. Don't tell about him. Don't say the truth is his. You go, but do not speak in his name anymore. We don't want to hear it. Peter says to them, What is an axiom for us? You decide whether it's better for us to obey God or man. But we cannot help but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And you know what, folks? We are going to be increasingly faced with whether or not we're all going to obey God or obey man. When the two are in agreement, when the two are in agreement, I am always to obey man. I'm to live under the ordinance of God as He put law in place. But whenever I come to the circumstances where man and God disagree, I must, to the disobedience of man, obey God. I must. Peter establishes that as a non-negotiable and he puts it in their court. You're not in agreement with God. And you're telling us not to speak anymore. So you decide, should we obey you or obey God? And I'm here to tell you, we can't help but obey God. It's time for us to decide now. Who are we going to obey? What are we going to do? And you know what? It sounds, in a sense, so novel. There's something chivalrous in us. Boy, just to live those circumstances. You know, often I think, how great would it be to go back and live in those days of castles and knights and queens and princesses. And boy, it would be so great. You know what? It wouldn't be so great. Because there wasn't any air conditioning. 
No electric air dryers, no flat irons, curling irons, no flushing plumbing. You know, there's just a lot about it that wouldn't be so great, just to be honest with you. But there's something chivalrous about it. Just, yeah, man, I could do that. And, you know, when we look at this, they kind of get that same sentiment. Yeah, boy, if I was there, I'm Ramboing it right there now. Come on, let's, let's on. But you know what? You and I live with the clear commands of God every day in freedom, and we don't obey them. Who do we think we are to say, boy, yeah, they put it on like that. Boy, obey God or man. I'm obeying God. And you don't know. I dare to tell you that the evidence is stacked against us. The evidence is stacked against us. Now's the time to say, you know what? Obeying God is really important. Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. What has God, what is God telling you that you ought to be doing that you're not doing? As we come to the end of this passage of Scripture, we're going to see this become a tight-knit group. I mean, they're looking at each other in persecution, and they're selling what they've got, and they're distributing to meet the needs of the others, and we say, man, yeah, if that happened to us, that would be us. Let me ask you a question. In the midst of your freedom, that little command that we happened to touch on this morning in Sunday school, 1 John chapter 2, love your brother. In the midst of your freedom, are you doing that? Are you? Reaching out now, caring now? Loving? Now? You know what? But I, I don't like the way he gets his hair cut. You know, you, you know I just... There, there are things about him that just, they really bother me. He, he doesn't like the same things I, I like, you, you know. Do, do I have to? I'm busy. Don't you know I'm busy? Are you? I mean, are you really loving your brother now? It's chivalrous to think of all that I do for him, you know, come persecution time. But again, I'm afraid the evidence is stacked against us. So notice what they do. They let him go. And look at verse 23. And being let go. Again, don't miss that little phrase. What would you do? Not just because you spent the night in prison and what's anticipated is, here we go. We saw what happened with Jesus and that's where we're going. Okay, that's what they're anticipating in their heart. This answer, this bold answer is given with an anticipation of we're heading for crosses too, somehow. And remember, it's not that long ago that Jesus said to Peter, I want you to understand what's going to happen to you. They're going to bind your hands and someone's going to lead you around. Here it is. This is, this is what's coming. And they say to him, you can go. Okay. I mean, is that how you're thinking they're responding? No. I won't do it and make you that are sleeping jump out of your skin, but I mean, it's woo-hoo time. I mean, don't, don't miss the emotion in this passage of Scripture. They just got set free, anticipating torture and possible death. And notice what they do. They went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Now notice this, don't miss it. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God 
which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, beginning and end of his life, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Notice the proximate response. First of all, they praised God. They praised God. Notice how they remind themselves of who God is and what God has done. God, you're God. God, you were in control when you created the worlds and as you sustained them. And even as the kings of the earth arrayed themselves, both at His birth and at His death, against your Son, it was under the watchful eye and the controlling hand of Almighty God. They did what you planned. You know what I ought to do when trouble comes? I ought to step away and I ought to remind myself who my God is. Who are you, God? Well, let me see if I can remember a few things about who you are, God. Right now I'm having a really hard time with my teenager. I'm afraid. It seems like every time we talk, I know what I want them to know in my heart, but the emotions get going and they yell at me or they ignore me and I respond and it's on every time. God, I'm, I'm really concerned. I don't know what to do. I want to kill them because I want them to live. That's turmoil right there. Well, God, who are you? Well, let me see. You made the world. Now that might not be quite as tough as changing a teenager's heart. But boy, it was, it was a tough one. You, you made the world. God, you've never broken a promise. When I look through the Old Testament and I think about some of the unbelievable things you said you were going to do. And then I read that you, you did them. You've never broken the promise. God, you're forgiving. Things that I could never forgive, I read in the Scriptures, but you forgave them. You're, you're forgiving. God, God, you're loving. looking at a people that were rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and he's trying to tell them about what you want to do for them and they throw him in a pit, in a pit. Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, you've loved me with an everlasting love. God, you're loving. Therefore, I can expect you to care. Who is your God? When trouble comes, whether it be trouble in your home, trouble in your marriage, trouble in your relationship, trouble at work, or persecution in the world for truth, remind yourself who God is. They praised Him. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine an empty, a vain, a worthless thing. You know, that's one of the puzzlements to us, isn't it? You know the truth. And you look at the world and they're believing a lie. And you look at the evidence. The next generation buys into the same thing the last generation did and the last generation bought into it and it destroyed them. This will make you happy. This will fulfill you. This is going to straighten things out. This will give you everything you want. And they end up in ruin and wreckage. And here come my children and they're buying into it. And I don't want them to buy it into it. Why in the world are they believing a vain thing? 
puzzling, isn't it? Remind yourself who God is. God, you know. God, you see. God, you understand. And even remember Joseph. Remember Joseph? Now what in the world did I do to get thrown in this pit? This is the pits. I mean, for him, it was the pits. I mean, it really was. And then he gets sold to heathen slave traders. Do you know what heathen slave traders do to slaves? Particularly ones they weren't planning on buying? They don't treat them really well. Then he gets sold as a slave. And he's chin up. I mean, he, he goes about his business and he, he gets to be the head of the household. Then he gets lied about. I mean, is there anything worse than that? He gets lied about. He didn't fall into sin. He did right. He refused to give in. And then somebody lies about him. And so he goes to prison. And he makes the best of his circumstances in prison. And the two guys that he does something good for, they forgot about him. Ever have that happen? And what about me over here? Now, pat in the back's not everything, but it's something. Ever feel that? Didn't you, didn't you notice me? He stays there in prison, and eventually the Lord favoring him, he gets raised. Second in the kingdom. And his brothers, the cause of it all, show up. <laughs> and here it is. What goes around, comes around, right? Now, with broken heart, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. My God was in control all along. Doesn't mean it was any less evil. Doesn't mean there wasn't sin involved. But is God in control? Can you see His sovereign hand? They praised Him. They remembered who their God was. And then they prayed. Then they prayed. God? Verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. I love the end of this chapter. <laughs> and when they had prayed, verse 31, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Did God have to say, I heard you. I'm listening. You got it. No, He didn't. But He did. God said, hey, you know what? I want you to know I'm going to do exactly what I said I was going to do. You opened your mouth. I filled it. And now you're asking for me to continue to do it? Let's shake things up. God answered them. And hear me, my friend. He'll answer you. Because He's the same God. Here's the big question. Will you do it His way? Oh, we often get things shaken up. But will you allow God to be the one that does it because you do it His way? Or just because you've decided, I've had enough. It's time to shake things up. That's usually not a good thing. Here we see them respond to persecution, real persecution. And in the immediate and in the proximate, did it God's way. And their God was faithful to do exactly what He said He would do. Here's the question for you. What will you do when trouble comes? 
Let's pray.